<laughs> Thank you, Sandy. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. Um, had a couple of weeks off, so that was amazing. That was great. And um, here I am today. Couldn't be here last week, so I watched Ray online. Good to hear you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you for those bits of personal testimony that you shared with us. That was great. I love hearing personal testimonies and how people came to know the Lord and how the Lord has led and guided through their life. Always share your testimony. It's a great thing. Get practiced at it. Tell people about it. Let them be encouraged in the Lord as they hear what the Lord's doing in your life. So um, today, yeah, we're in 1 John chapter 3. Okay, so uh, Ray last week started in chapter 3. So we're up to verse 11 today. And uh, we're going through to verse 24. So um, 1 John chapter 3. So you'll see there, that picture there up there, that um, reminds me of in the beginning. So that's um, the picture that uh, Michelangelo painted on the uh, roof of the Sistine Chapel. I've been there. And um, it reminds us that God created man. It reminds us that God put life into man. It reminds us of lots of things. And um, it reminds me especially that in the beginning, God loved man. And he still does. And he always will. If you have your Bible with you, open it to 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to read in verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Verse 19, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in, in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And the Lord will bless the reading of his word. As I was uh, thinking about this passage, that, um, that verse in Hebrews came to mind. Hebrews 4.12, and it says, For the word of God is alive and active, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And as I was thinking about this passage that we're looking at, may that be your experience today. That the Spirit of God puts his finger on your heart. puts his finger on your thoughts and um, allows you by his spirit to make adjustments where needed and to make confession where needed. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray that today that you would speak to us from it. 
I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would encourage us in the Lord. And I pray that we might leave this place trusting you, following you, full of you. In your dear name's sake, I pray. Amen. So the, the message from the beginning, this is the message you heard from the beginning, it says in verse 11. And there's three words here. I heard of a story of a guy, a preacher, who preached on this passage. And for three weeks in a row, he preached on this passage. And for three weeks in a row, he preached three words. Love one another. And so if he was up here today, I would go and he would sit down and that was it. And for the next 45 minutes, you're going to be thinking about love one another. And so the next week he came and he got up and he said the same thing. Love one another. And he went and sat down. And the people in the congregation, well, they looked at each other and I thought, well, what are we going to do now? Well, I suppose we better do what the word says, love one another. And for three weeks in a row that happened and that church apparently changed its direction, changed its attitude, changed everything. Because those people loved one another. And that's the word for you and I today, to love one another. This is the message that we've heard from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all that God had made by his own admission was very good. And in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. And from the beginning, the Lord God wanted communion with his creation. And in the cool of the day, the Lord was looking for Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 3, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. We know it was cool. We don't know whether it was morning. We don't know whether it was evening. We don't know whether it was night, but it was in the cool time. And I, I wonder, I often wonder when I read that, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord. I wonder what that, what, what that sound was. Was it? I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was the sound of a, a breeze, a wind. God is the spirit. They that worship God, worship in spirit and in truth. But they heard him. They heard him. God wanted to have communion with them. And God loved his creation then, and he loves his creation now. And even at the point of creation, right back then, his love was very evident. Because God was doing something to make that relationship possible into the future of forever. God's love, it's an active love. It does stuff. It's not just words, it's action. And my mind went to a verse in Revelation 13, 8, and this is what it says. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb, slain from the creation of the world. Wow. So way back here in creation, that verse is reminding me and telling me that God had a plan because he loved you and me. Slain from the creation of the world, his son. God is love and we love him because he first loved us. That's the, uh, in 1 John chapter 4 there. John 3.16 is a famous verse that you all know and you can repeat by heart. But when I was reading this and uh, thinking about that verse, I was kind of thinking of it in this way. In the beginning, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the beginning. 
This is the message you heard. Love one another. Love is from God. God loves his creation. He wants fellowship. In Genesis chapter 3, in the beginning of the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they made a tabernacle so God could dwell among his people. And God maintained relationship with his people through sacrifice and offerings in the times of the patriarchs, the judges, the prophets, and the kings. And then King Solomon was a day to build the temple where God could dwell among his people. And then in the first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, the prophet Isaiah's prophecy comes to pass. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then Matthew 1, 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is still looking for you and I. He wants fellowship with you and I. He loves you. He loves me. And we have heard this from the beginning but he loves us and our responsibility is not only to love god but to love one another even back in leviticus in leviticus 19 18 it says do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone looking among your people but love your neighbor as yourself i am the lord John was a tradie. His trade was fishing. He was a working man. His language is very black and white. It's cut and dried. It's uncomplicated. It's hard to kind of get it wrong. It's hard to misinterpret it. And Ray finished on 1 John 3.10 last week, and this is what it says. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. This is how you work it out. I want to know if that person's a Christian, a follower of Jesus, or I want to know, no, that person is not a follower of Jesus. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. That's fairly easy language. It's not tickling the ears language. It's blunt and it's raw. And if you don't love other Christians, your faith is a sham. It's not real. You're kidding yourself. You're not on your way to heaven. In chapter 2, of this uh, book 1 John 7 to 11 John compares loving a brother or sister to living in the light or to living in darkness light and darkness and here in this passage John ramps it up somewhat and compares loving and not loving a brother or sister to life and death Now, when it comes to the matter of love, Wisby says there are four levels of relationship on which a person may live. I've been reading Warren Wisby. I enjoy his stuff. He has good outlines. And um, this is his outline. And um, in verses 11 to 12, the, uh, the first level of relationship in which a person may live is murder. And then in verses 13 to 15, it's hatred. In verses 16 to 17, it's indifference. And verses 18 to 24 is Christian compassion. Now, I think I've probably got to turn this on first and feel it vibrate. Done. Okay, so if I go there. Okay, so the first one is murder. The first two that we talked about, murder and hatred, are not Christian. The third is less than Christian. 
And the fourth is compatible with true Christian love. Verse 12 reminds us, don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Cain was not an atheist. Funny that. Cain had a personal relationship with God. Cain worshipped God. Cain is an example of a life of hatred. There's lots of dialogue in Genesis chapter 4 of God and Cain having conversation. These boys have been brought up the same. They had the same mum and dad. They both brought sacrifices to God. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. God told Cain that. Hey, mate, that's not good enough. You know better. You can do something about it. This is not the end. Get it sorted, Cain. Did he? No, he didn't. Children of the devil can masquerade as true believers. Children of the devil can attend religious gatherings and bring, bring offerings. But these actions in themselves are not valid proof that a person is born of God. Cain's spiritual father was the devil, and he decided to follow him. Abel's murder was premeditated. And uh, the real test is Cain's love for his brothers. And here Cain failed. And so the, the things that we need to learn from this is that you and I have a responsibility to love our brothers and sisters and to make sure that there's nothing in between us that is going to break that fellowship between ourselves and between us and God. You may be thinking, I've never murdered anyone. I haven't done that. And to this statement, God replies, yes. But remember, to a Christian, hatred is the same as murder. So the difference between point one here and point two is the outward act of taking life. The inward intent is the same. It's no difference. I read this little story a couple of times as I was preparing for this message. And um, it, was, it popped up in a couple of uh, different uh, books I was reading. And, of, and it goes like this. A visitor at the zoo was chatting with the zookeeper at the lion enclosure. And the visitor says, I have a cat at home. And um, your lions, you know, they just act exactly like my cat. <laughs> Look at them. They're sleeping so peacefully. It seems a shame that you have to put these beautiful creatures behind bars. And the zookeeper, he has a chuckle. And he says, these animals may look like your cat in a lot of ways act like your cat. And in fact, some very clever person may be able to tell you how their genus is connected. But their disposition is radically different. There's murder in the heart of a lion, and you better be glad the enclosure is there. That lion, he wants to kill you. If you get in his way, he's not going to uh, ask questions and say, excuse me, sir, can you please move aside? I want to pass through. No. Lions kill people. Crocodiles kill people. You've probably seen pictures on YouTube like, like I have where people are taking photos of lions from the window of their car and all of these things. And before they can get the shutter clicked and put away the things half in the window and trying to haul them out. And... You don't trust 
those animals. There's murder in his heart. And the only reason some people never actually murdered is because of the bars. The fear of arrest, going to jail, the possibility of death. Depending on where you live, these things are the deterrent. Verse 13 says, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Just like that line of their, their hate is irrational and illogical. It's the same as Cain's hate. Cain's worship was unacceptable to God, and he had the opportunity to change it. But as a result, envy, jealousy, rage, all these things took control, and he decided to follow the devil. And nothing has changed. And here we are today. People hate the Lord's people for the same reason. Because their worship is unacceptable. The gods of this age, lawlessness, money, sexuality, all of those things, their worship is unacceptable to God and people don't like it. And so they get envious and jealous. You know better than me. You think you're a goody two-shoes. I'm going to cut your head off. And that's what's happening. And in the day and age in which we live, there are more people being murdered for their belief and trust in the Lord Jesus than any other time in history before us. In Psalm 2, it says, they rise up against his anointed, saying, let's break their chains, throw off their shackles. And that's what people are doing in the world in which we live here in Queensland, here in Brisbane. We don't like you, God. We don't like what you have to say in the Bible. So we would like to be able to kill babies before they're born. We would like to be able to take people's lives before they're quite ready for it. All of these things. We'll break their shackles. We want to throw them off, throw off their chains. And so, if you're being harassed for being a believer, be assured you've passed from <clears throat> death to life. Verse 15 says to us, you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. A murderer can repent and follow Jesus. You need to be reminded of that. But anyone who keeps on murdering does not have eternal life residing in him. And anyone who hates a brother or sister does not have eternal life residing in them. Have a think for a minute. Close your eyes if you need to. Is there anyone in my life, a brother or sister in the Lord, who I'm having an argument with that I need to get sorted out? May the Lord put his finger on anything in your life and my life that needs to be sorted. Because the Bible clearly says, and John clearly says, anyone who hates a brother or sister does not have eternal life residing in them. Do you know a brother or a sister who won't talk to you? Or are you one of those persons that won't talk to them? Have a think about that. Because the Bible says, if we hate a brother or sister, we don't have eternal life. Verses 16 and 17 talks about indifference. And it goes like this. This is a great verse, isn't it? You know, John 3.16 is a great verse. You should memorize that. And 1 John 3.16 is a great verse, and you should rem remember that one also. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And in verse 17, it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Indifference. Indifference describes sin in this way. It's saying, God, I know what you want from me, but I don't care. 
I know what you want, God, but I don't care. In our indifference, we look at the cross of the Lord Jesus, that amazing act of love and sacrifice of, on God's part, and we say, God, I see your love and I see your amazing gift of grace that you have given us through your immense suffering, but I don't care. That's what indifference says. Christian love is not simply failure to do evil to others. It also involves doing good to others. And so, as we've been reminded, we know John 3.16. We ought well pay attention to 1 John 3.16. Because it's more wonderful to share that experience by obeying. Christian love involves sacrifice and service. The Lord Jesus didn't simply talk about love. He died to prove it. The Lord Jesus was not killed as a martyr. He willingly laid down his life. Christian love is personal and active. And in Galatians 6.10, it reminds us, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, especially. And um, I was also reminded of um, that lawman who asked the Lord Jesus, who is my neighbor? And you remember the Lord Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan and how two people just passed by on the other side. Oh, sorry, mate, you look like you're, you're dead, but it's not my business, not my problem. And then the Samaritan fella came along and uh, looked after that man and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, it says, put him in a, a place of respite where he could get help, paid for it, looked after him and till he was uh, able to uh, leave of his own accord. And the Lord Jesus was making it clear that people in need are our neighbors. People in need are our responsibility to help and assist where possible. And so in this parable again, who is my neighbor? And the test of Christian love is not about spruiking off about loving the whole church of God wherever they are. It's about quietly helping a brother or sister in need. We don't need to be a murderer in order to sin or to have hatred in our heart. Indifference is sufficient. That'll do it. Verse 18 to 24, Christian love. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, James 2.15 says. And if one of you says to them, hey, go in peace, mate, keep warm, well fed, does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? And so in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. To love in word means to talk about a need. To love in deed or action means to do something about it. To love in word means to love insincerely. To love in truth means to love, in, love a person genuinely from the heart, not just with words or from the tongue. You may say, well, you know, we discussed it and we prayed about it. And I can say now that I've done my duty. But love involves more than words. It calls for sacrificial deeds. And that's why sinners were attracted to the Lord Jesus, because he loved them sincerely. He loved them genuinely. He loved them from the heart. And he provided for their needs. The next part of this 
verse so, from 18 to 24. It reminds us of some wonderful blessings that will come to a believer who practices Christian love. And in verses 19 and 20, this is what it says. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. What a wonderful thing that is. My heart and your heart at rest in the presence of God. Assurance. Do you have the assurance of salvation? Do you have the assurance that you're on your way to heaven? Praise God. What a wonderful thing it is to have the assurance of the Lord in your heart today. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In 1 Timothy 1.19, it says, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. How's your conscience today? Your conscience is something that you should protect with all care. Your conscience is something that should be guarded carefully. Do not sink your conscience. Many men, many women, many believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, many preachers have sunk their conscience. And as a result, not only has their, perhaps their faith suffered shipwreck, but their congregation also has been shipwrecked. And my friends here today, if that's what you do, if you seek your conscience, your faith will suffer shipwreck. If you seek your conscience, the devil will be in your ear and he'll be saying, hey, mate, you can't get up there. You did that. Hey, man, you can't, you can't do that. Hey, sister, you can't do that. You can't lead that. Look what you did. Look what you've got in your heart. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you. He will make life difficult for you. And you'll be useless for the Lord. You'll be a coward sitting in the pews if your conscience is not clear. Get it sorted. If there is something on your mind today, if there's some person that you are not right with, if there is another believer that you know that you have wronged and you need to sort it, sort it before the Lord, before the sun goes down today. Believers should settle the matter before he offers, his, offers worship. A clear conscience is a wonderful thing. If our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Answered prayer. What a wonderful thing that is to have answers to our prayers. And in verses 24, we have God's presence through his spirit. You'll remember that. That was a, that was a, um, a big cruise liner in the Greek Isles. Okay, so Captain Sunky's conscience, of course, was on the turfs and all that kind of stuff. He knew he shouldn't be on that. And then as a result, the, he goes into too shallow water, the boat grounded, fell over the side, people died. He tried to escape the boat, all kinds of things. But a terrible thing that was. Imagine your Christian life in that state because you sunk your conscience. Don't do it. Don't do it. In verse 23, we're reminded <laughs> to believe in Jesus, to love the saints, 
And may your love for God today be a doing and active love. And we're going to leave it there and be challenged by those words, though. May your love for God be a doing love and an active love. And then you'll have the confidence and assurance that you're a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today. And I pray that you would bless it to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sandy.